Good morning, church. I welcome you to this Sunday morning on our virtual worship service. All of us here are gathered to worship the Lord. Let us look at Psalm 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Come to Him who calls us to holiness and righteousness. And we pray this morning that our offering of praise will be pleasing to Him. Commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust in Him and He shall bring them to pass. These are the days of revival. Lord's going to bring what's dead back to life. Amen. What's hurting? The days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of retrial, of famine and darkness and sword. Do we are the voices? salvation. My Savior, 
Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same because you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's only Son. You lived, you died, you rose again on high. You opened the way for the world to live again. Hallelujah. Amen. My Savior, Redeemer, lifted me from the miry clay. Almighty, forever, I will never be the same as you came near. From the everlasting to the world we live, the Father's own. Son, you lived, you died, you rose again on high, you opened the way for the world to live again, hallelujah, for all you've done, you lived, you died, you rose Responsive reading is taken from Psalm 85, and we're going to read responsively the first 13 verses from the New Living Translation. And if you are able, would you stand with me as we read God's Word together? Lord, you poured out blessings on your land, you restored the fortunes of Israel. You held back your fury, you kept back your blazing anger. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations?
show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. But let them not return to their foolish ways. Unfailing love and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings, our land will yield its bountiful harvest. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may now be seated. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the knowledge of who you are and also, Lord, that we belong to you. You who are omnipotent, you who care so much for each one of us, you who look out for us, watch over us. Lord, we are reminded so many times in your word, Lord, that you care for us, you love us, and that you sustain us. And we thank you that we can congregate today and celebrate your faithfulness in our lives. And we pray, Master, that you would continue to lead us, to guide us into paths of righteousness so that your name is lifted up by all who see each one of us. And Master, we particularly pray for those who are hurting today, those who are sick, those who are in hospitals or even at home who need a touch from you, we ask that your healing hand would be upon them and that you would restore them. Lord, we pray for those who are going through financial difficulties. Lord, we pray that you would bring to them, Master, the resources they need to go through the month and be able to pay all their bills and, Lord, to live without tension, Master, on how to stretch their finances to the end of the month. We pray for those in homes who are having trouble, relationships, strife, anger, all of these issues that may come from just working from home. And we pray that your peace would prevail in these homes. And Lord, we also pray for doctors and nurses and those who are taking care of the sick, Lord, especially during this pandemic, that you would energize them, keep them safe, and that you would even keep their families, Master, safe from all harm and danger. And Lord, we pray that as we go through this service, that we would have an encounter with you, an encounter that will leave us invigorated, energized, and with hope for the future that is in front of us. We commit this service to you and pray this prayer in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Shall we pray together? Our Heavenly Father, as we bring these offerings before you, we want to say how thankful we are for the ways in which you have blessed us, sustained us and provided for all our needs. And Lord, we now invite your blessing upon this offering and we ask that you would give us the grace and the knowledge and the understanding to use it so that your name is lifted. And it's in that name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Well, before we get into the word today, just want to remind you about the Bible study that has been going on for the last uh, two, three weeks now. And uh, we're in Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, uh, Colossians, and uh, we've been enjoying it. It's on Zoom. So uh, I trust that all of you who were and are interested in the Bible study on Wednesdays have been able to get the link. And if you haven't, 
please send me a mail uh, or a WhatsApp message and I'll make sure that you are added on to uh, the, the group that gets the Zoom link every Wednesday. We meet around the table on Wednesdays and again, if you don't want to partake of communion on Wednesday, that's perfectly fine. We offer it just in case you may have missed a Sunday or that some of you just like to be around the table and I think that's a wonderful thing to do. But again, there's uh, it's, it's up to you uh, just to be there and enjoy it or just celebrate as others uh, partake of it. So it's completely up to you how you want to end that service. But we have a, a wonderful time with the Lord every Wednesday and I'd like to invite you to join us if you haven't so far. All right, we're looking at Matthew's Gospel and the 14th chapter. And uh, when you look at this chapter, and I'll let you find uh, this passage in your own devices or the Bible. Um, but when you look at this particular chapter, it starts off with uh, a bit of sad news because we see that uh, John the Baptist is... Uh, beheaded. Um, he spoke out against uh, Herod, telling him that uh, he shouldn't be um, with his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and uh, she didn't like it. And so on his birthday, uh, the daughter of Herodias was dancing and Herod liked it very much and uh, promised her uh, anything that she wanted with an oath. And uh, prompted by her mother, she asked for John the Baptist's head on a platter. And uh, Herod gave it to her. And in, in verse 13, it says that when Jesus heard about John, he withdrew from there in a boat, boat to a secluded place by himself. And when the people heard of this, they followed him on foot from the cities. And I imagine that Jesus was so grieved that uh, John was no more and uh, wanted to just spend time alone. And yet even as he went to the secluded place, people followed him for his uh, fame had spread and people knew that there were wonderful things that he was doing right from teaching to uh, healing people and uh, confronting the demonic. And so they come there, they find him there even, uh, though he's on a boat and when he comes back ashore, he sees all of these people there and the disciples come to him and say, this place is a desolate place. Send the people home uh, so that they can go into the village and buy food. And, and uh, then we see the famous uh, narrative of Jesus uh, feeding the 5,000, isn't it? Uh, and then at the end of it, in uh, verse 22, immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. I'm reading from verse 22. 23. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And it, when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, that would be somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's Son. 
when they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. Well, this is a passage that you know very well and you've heard it many times and uh, I've preached from this a uh, couple of times as well. And so when this popped up for me on the lectionary, I was thinking, Lord, is this what you really want me to preach or should I look for another passage? But couldn't get away from this particular passage. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to preach. I believe that your word continues to have fresh revelation for us as we look into it. And I'm just going to wait upon you to show me what needs to be shared with uh, everybody on this Sunday or whenever people listen to this uh, sermon. And so I'm trusting the Lord for that. So would you just join me as we seek the Lord's uh, anointing and uh, instruction for us? Lord Jesus, this is an account of how you walked on water and how you dealt with Peter. And Lord, we want to know how this relates to us today. So Lord, inspire us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Reveal fresh truth to us and help us to apply it in our day-to-day -day lives. We ask this in your precious and holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, so here's the story in a, in a kind of a gist form here. Jesus sends the disciples across and he goes up. He wants to still be by himself, pray. And the disciples go across in the boat and they come across the storm and they are far from the shore. So they are stuck in the middle and then out of the storm, the wind and the waves and all of that, they see a figure walking to them and they are terrified. Well, that's not something that you see every day. In the midst of a storm for a figure to come walking, especially walking on the waves, on the sea. And so they're terrified and they think it's a ghost. And then Jesus cries out to them and says, it's okay, it's me. Don't be afraid. And then this remarkable response from Peter. Suddenly the fear that they all had and he must have had as well is gone. The moment he knows it is Jesus, he says, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come to you on the water. And all Jesus says is come. And Peter is over the boat and walking to Jesus. And then the Bible tells us that suddenly he saw the waves and he began to get fearful. And immediately he began to sink. But then he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out and picked him up and said, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, immediately the storm ceased. And the rest of them who were in the boat said, Surely you are the Son of God. Well, you and I won't have much opportunity to walk on waves. Uh, but as we look at this particular passage, I believe that there are some thoughts that we can glean from it that we can take and apply into our lives that will enable us to live lives of excitement and exhilaration. Because just imagine Peter, a fisherman who lived his life just under the vagaries of the weather and the sea. They dictated what he could and couldn't do. And yet here he is, having walked on the water. Imagine what an exciting moment it must have been for him to just be walking and looking around and saying, Wow, I'm actually walking! on this water in the midst of a storm with all these rising waves, I'm walking. And I believe that in our own lives, as we go through our own journey with the Lord, 
that the Lord doesn't intend for life to be boring. He doesn't intend for us to just live these kind of mediocre lives that don't have any excitement. We get up and it's one boring day after another. We just do what we need to do. I believe that every now and then, God just gives us mountaintop experiences that just excite us, that are so thrilling. And that's part of what it means to, to be a disciple of Jesus. It's not a boring thing. It's not just something so sad and dreary, but there's great joy in following after Jesus. And I believe that even as we look at this passage, that we can find wonderful nuggets of truth that I'm going to share with you that can help us. And if that is exactly how, we, or if that is where you are, just going through the motions of being a Christian or a disciple and saying, well, there's nothing extraordinary that happens. That maybe today you can say, Lord, I'd, I'd like to figuratively walk on water too, to get that kind of excitement in my life. So I'm going to place before you about five points and then very quickly go through them and see how we can apply it to our own lives to move from just a ordinary kind of life into something that is exhilarating and exciting and thrilling in following after the Lord. Here's the first thing. Every now and then in our Christian walk, we get to do something exhilarating. Seize it. Every now and then in our Christian walk, we get to do something exhilarating or exciting. And we've got to seize it. Listen to this. All the disciples had an opportunity that day to walk on water. Isn't it? All of them did. Only Peter seized that opportunity. The old adage is so true. Opportunity only knocks once. Isn't it? It just comes to us once. And if we miss it, we miss it. I, I think of Peter, you know, just sometimes sitting around with people and then reminiscing about his time with Jesus and then his eyes lighting up and then saying, you know, I walked on water. I, I walked on water towards Jesus. And the awe in people's faces as they looked at him and said, my goodness, we are in the presence of one who actually walked on water. And Peter was able to say that because he took the opportunity when it came. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Come, said Jesus. And he was out of the boat and walking to Jesus. The others get to tell their friends and their children and grandchildren, I don't know, but they get to say, you know what? I was there too when Peter walked on water. I was there too. I didn't walk on water, but I saw Peter walking on water. That's all they could get excited about. Nothing compared to the excitement that Peter would have had in actually walking on water. And so that's the first point that I want us to think about. That God puts into our lives wonderful moments that will excite us. I think that that's part of what is captured in the abundant life that Jesus promised. That we will have wonderful moments when we trust Him. When we're able to do just amazing things. And be part of those amazing things that God allows into our lives. But we've got to seize that opportunity. So, seize it is the first point. Secondly, do due diligence first. Do due diligence first. What do I mean by that? Peter made sure before he got out and began to try walking on the water. First, he said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. If it's you, then 
you say the word and when you say the word i will then come due diligence he didn't just jump and say oh that's jesus let me walk just like he's walking no if it is you command me and then jesus said come and then he was off and out of the boat is the lord in it is the question we need to ask is this from the lord before we jump into something that is exciting or exhilarating make sure that this is what the lord is putting on your plate how do you do that how do we know that this is from the lord well i have always said that god's will and god's peace always go together so however daunting however challenging this thing is that you think god is inviting you to take a step into just as getting out of the boat must have been to peter do you have that sense of peace not from saying oh yeah i can do this walking on water is not a not a problem but wow goodness that's the most difficult thing i've ever seen but why do i have this strange sense of well-being about it god's will and his peace always go together as paul would say in philippians 4:7 and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in christ jesus it's this peace that will come together to let you know that this is the will of god because if it's not you will feel god's spirit ruffling the waters of your heart and saying no this is not from me but when you have this sense of peace and well-being that tells you boy this is so difficult and yet i have this sense that this is right that's when you need to be able to move so make sure that you do due diligence first before jumping in thirdly keep your eyes on him his power presence and promises and not on your circumstances keep your eyes on him his power his presence and his promises and not on your circumstances situations and circumstances beloved always have the potential to be overwhelming but remember you're not operating in your own strength you're operating in the power of the lord god almighty peter could never have walked on water by himself as a fisherman god gave him that beautiful moment empowered him to do something extraordinary like what he did and it is through the power of god that we are able to do these things that are human minds and capacity say that is not possible and again paul reminds us in philippians 4:7 or 4:13 i can do all things through christ who strengthens me if this thing is from the lord then he has enabled you he has empowered you to do it beloved you remember the story isn't it of caleb and joshua who went with the other 10 uh, israelites to check out the promised land and we read about it in numbers chapter 13 and it's worth looking at if you would quickly just turn to the 13th chapter of numbers from verse 30 on they come back and after checking out the land this is what they come and tell moses then sorry let me back up yeah in verse 27 chapter 13 verse 27 they said we went into the land where you sent us and it certainly does flow with milk and honey and this is its fruit nevertheless the people who live in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large and moreover we saw the descendants of anak there 
Amalek is living at the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites are living in the hill country and the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, We should by all means go up and take possession of it for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in, in spying it out, is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. And then they said, And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Remember, this is the land that had been promised. God was already in it. And yet, when they went in, ten of them focused on the things that seemed daunting, forgetting that they were actually walking in the promise of the Almighty God. Except for Caleb and Joshua, the only two who made it into the promised land. For God made them wander for forty years years before they could come back in. So make sure, make very sure that you don't get caught up by situations and circumstances, that you keep your eyes on Him and His power, His presence and His promises to you. Fourthly, if you fall, call out to Him. If you fall, call out to Him. Sometimes when we fall, when we've taken a step of faith and we fall, then our gut response is to crawl into a hole and say, my goodness, I'm never going to do this again. Lord, I thought I was following you and look where it's got me. Now I'm just upset. I'm angry. And then it gets deeper and deeper. We stop reading the word. We stop praying. We stop taking communion and all of these things just add up. And yet it could be that there was an obstacle that came. But God was willing for you to move past it. God was willing that this was still His will, just as it was for Jesus, for Peter to walk on water. He fell because he took his eyes off the Lord. But it was still the will of Jesus for Peter to walk on water. So, Make sure that when you fall or if you fall, that you call out to the Lord. Don't try and rely on your own self. As Peter said, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus did that. I uh, remember many, many years ago when we were just getting ready to going through study and seminary and all of that. And... Uh, going through a very difficult time in terms of health because we answered the call to uh, go and get equipped and then come back and start the church and uh, got hit by uh, trouble with my knees, osteoarthritis, what they said at that time. And that's the time that I found out I had diabetes as well. And it seemed like, you know, we were being thwarted or I was being thwarted because I was thinking, Lord, you called us to serve you and now this is what I've got. And then remember saying, no, but I'm not. Whatever it is, we're going to serve you. And then one day, remember lying down in bed and, and just crying out to the Lord and being physically attacked by Satan and feeling a hand on my neck pushing me down. It's one of the... I, th I think the only time that I've actually been physically assaulted by Satan, I remember crying out to God and saying, Lord, help me. And then the hand was released. I remember praying in the next couple of days, uh, sometime around that time, saying, Lord, I desperately need you to hold me during this time. And the Lord said, look up. And I did. And I saw this hand reaching out to me and said, it's always there. All you need to do is to hold on to me. 
So, beloved, recognize that when we take steps of faith, there may be times when we fall, but God, God's hand is always there, ready to pick us up, to put us back onto firm ground, in Peter's case, firm waters, isn't it? And to help us to continue on that way rather than retreat, draw into ourselves and forget about what God wanted to do. So, fourthly, if you fall, call out to him. And then lastly, when Jesus offers you his hand, take it. When Jesus offers you his hand, take it. I remember reading the story of a, of a man who was uh, on his second floor flat uh, house and the floods had come in and uh, it was pouring and he just got on top of the roof and he was crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, save me, save me, you've got to help me. And uh, a rowboat came by and the guy shouted and said, hey, if you want to just jump in here, I'll take you to safety. And the guy said, no, no, it's okay. God's going to come and get me. And the rowboat went away and then a motorboat came by and the guy saw him on the roof and he said, hey, come to me, I'll take you to safety. And the guy said, no, no, I've got, I've got faith. God's going to get me. I've been praying and telling God about my situation. And the motorboat went away and then a helicopter came. They dropped a rope to him and said, hey, grab a hold of the rope and we'll take you to safety. And he said, no, no, I'm praying God's going to get me. And then the floodwaters came and the man drowned and landed up in heaven and uh, couldn't wait to get to God and say, Lord, what happened? I trusted you. And then as the story goes, he did and said, God, what happened? And God said, well, I sent a rowboat, I sent a motorboat and I sent a helicopter. But you didn't take any of them. That's a story. But it brings home a truth, isn't it? Sometimes we have very set ways of how God must come and save us. Isn't it? We have our own little box that we say, Okay, Lord, I need your help, but this is the route that you need to come to help me. And God says, I mean, that small little box that you have, I don't operate inside your box. This is my world, my universe. I created it. I can come in in any way that you have no idea about and help you. But when I do, take my hand and allow me to bring you to shore or to safety. So don't have preset ways of how God should save you, provide for you or take care of you. Remember that he knows what's best for you. You know, beloved, I started by saying that the Christian life is not just in somber drudgery that it's fun to follow him to walk with him to converse with him and experience him in fresh new ways and yes there there may be difficult ways or challenging ways but we still follow after him let's not make the normal average our normal the one that we just go through the motions. Let's look to the Lord and say, Lord, if Peter could walk on water, I'd like to do something too. I'd like for you to help me to do something that defies everything that I can think about. Lord, what is it that you have for me that's exhilarating? The disciples saw him heal the sick, the lame, the blind, the deaf, feed thousands of people, raise Lazarus from the dead, see the transfiguration figuration, and now walk on water. Exciting, exhilarating things. And he's the same God, beloved, that you and I follow. Don't settle for just a mundane, average, dour life. John Ottberg wrote a book and titled it if you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. And maybe today God is saying, Okay, 
Stop hanging on to the side rails of the swimming pool. You've got to get out to the deep and enjoy the water. Stop playing safe. I've got things. I've got you. Don't just settle for things in your life. Take that step or a leap of faith. Hold his hand and say, what do you have in store for me, Jesus, that I can feel the wind on my face? I want excitement, exhilaration, elation and thrill in my life because I know that that's part of what it means to follow the Almighty God and to be His disciple. Amen. Well, our closing hymn is about Jesus. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him, I would fall. Shall we sing this together? And I'd like to invite you to stand as we do that. listening to the sermon or this, through this whole service and you feel God nudging you and saying, you know, I've got things planned for you or maybe you're on the cusp of something and you've just been sitting back in fear or whatever, you've just felt the Holy Spirit say to you, take that step of faith. Well, I want to pray for you, beloved. Would you take that step of faith before we I pronounce the benediction? If that's who you are and you're responding to the Lord today, would you just stand where you are or even kneel or do something just to let the Lord know that you are saying yes to Him today? Would you just take that posture as I pray for you right now? 
Heavenly Father, on each of these precious ones who have answered the call to follow you and now, Lord, want to step out of the boat to take that step of faith that says, Lord, I want to follow you, whether it's difficult or not, whether I don't understand it or not. I want to get out of the boat, Lord. I pray that you would come alongside of them and infuse them, Lord, with more power from your Holy Spirit, Lord, that they would be able to follow after you. That excitement and exhilaration of bring, being a child of the Most High God will be their heritage, Lord. I pray this in the powerful, magnificent name of Jesus. Amen. And now may I invite you to stand for the benediction. Dearly beloved, know that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it on to its completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you and you have a wonderful, wonderful week. 